Board. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Food on the Page, Cookbooks, Menus, and American Culture. My name is Christy Brazil. I'll be the Master of Ceremonies this evening, presenting Mary Ellen Burns. Kelsey Grant, excuse me, Kelsey Mayer will be our, our tech host, and Kathy Hart is in the wings helping out as well, too. Mary Ellen Burns collects cookbooks, kitchen gadgets, and food-related ephemera. She's the former owner of In Any Event, a Sacramento special events and catering firm. She now writes and teaches about food, writing, history, art, and travel. She winces when asked how many cookbooks she owns for it's not the quality, but the number that is significant. Menus and matchbooks are a constant acquisition. She also directed Food Talk, a series of food-related talks, workshops, and classes held in partnership with the Sacramento Public Library and the Sacramento County Historical Society. And we are where we eat in partnership with Capital Public Radio. She's a member of Les Dames de Sophie, Slow Food, the Culinary Historians of Northern California, and many others and authors of five or more books on food and food history, including Lost Restaurants of Sacramento, one of my favorites, and their recipes, A Taste of History, Pear Perfection, and Whip Up a Cookbook. Her newest book, Extracts, mostly true stories with a sprinkling of recipes, should have been out by now, but she's having way too much fun developing programs like this one tonight. So please welcome and listen to all Mary Ellen has to share with us this evening. And welcome to all our guests from out of the area that have joined us as well too. Mary Ellen? Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen. And thank you for just, let's start the slideshow. So the talk today is food on the page. Food is, uh, and let me show you already. I have a lot of slides for this one. Food is a lens through which I view the world. I often spend hours at the grocery store or the farmer's market watching people put food into their baskets. I wanna know, do they take time? Do they read the labels when they're uh, getting things? Do they go down the uh, aisle just kind of grabbing things from cereal or frozen foods or are they in the fresh food section? The way that people cook and eat, the utensils that they own, how they set their table, what cookbooks, if any, they use tell a story. These are just a few of the menus that I have in my collection. As I said before, I probably have well over a thousand of them. Menus also tell a story. Mel menus tell stories about time and place, the way people dined during different decades to celebrate special occasions, or as quick repasts before, during, or after work. They're much more than guides to your next meal. They will tell you who you want to be, where you think you fit into your social world, and what cultures you feel comfortable exploring. Tonight, we're gonna to look very briefly at American cookbooks and restaurant menus, and just a few matchbooks and other material that uh, I've got as well. I'm gonna share my passion for collecting, you'll have an opportunity to share your stories and experiences as well. Between cookbooks, food memoir in history, menus, matchbooks, and other restaurant and food artifacts and memorabilia, I've collected over 6,000 pieces. They are both in the room that's uh, with me, kind of inundating where I, I'm sitting. I have them in my basement. I have them scattered in friends' houses now as well. I find them in thrift shops and flea markets, used in new bookstores, antique fairs, and occasionally online. I don't like buying them online very much because it's the thrill of finding them in unexpected places that I prefer. I've had the really good fortune of purchasing a friend of mine, Linda Sakai's cookbook collection when she died. I'm sorry that she's um, gone. Her tastes were very eclectic. These were actually from her cookbook collection. They reflected um, a, a real love of ethnic cuisines. They oftentimes had little marginalia and, and check marks uh, all over. There were telltale stains 
told that a real cook had been at work. Her newer books were usually pristine, though a close inspection did show wear from some repeated um, reading. No longer able to eat the foods that she loved, she had squamish cell um, mouth cancer. She read recipes as a link to the past or immersed herself in a world in which she could pretend to eat whatever she wanted. She found meaning in dishes that brought back memories of family and friends. The one thing that was disappointing when I got to the collection, because uh, she had worked at Sutter Hospitals with me, is that she was a wonderful cook of native dishes, Japanese um, recipes, and there were only two recipes that were Japanese because those recipes came from the muscle memory in her hands and she didn't need to write them down. My cookbooks rarely contain butter or traces of cake batter. I can't remember the last time I used a recipe from a book. I read cookbooks like some people read novels drawing inspiration for improvisational cooking. I reserve food stains for my clothes. I even bake, in, uh, uh, I don't even follow recipes for baking and sometimes I'm successful and sometimes not. The, Christmas, um, I first began cooking at about the age of eight when my mother had to go back to work. She no longer had time to cook for us during the week. I started by helping out my father in the kitchen. I thought at the time that they were such poor cooks that uh, my two brothers and I took over almost entirely. And when I was 21, she gave me a copy of The Joy of Cooking as a wedding present, as did a lot of us. That was probably one of the first books that we ever got. My first husband really preferred a minimal lifestyle. He could not handle any clutter at all. Uh, I started collecting restaurant matchbooks and menus instead, something I had started years earlier when I collected my first one at the Ram restaurant that some of us in Sacramento might know when I went for my junior prom. And um, each menu or, or matchbook that I would look at holds a story that reminds me not only of the special occasion or the meal, but the conversations I often had with waiters or uh, bartenders, other diners or the owners. And again, for those of you outside the area, you might not recognize some of these. This is Spanger's Fish Grotto from Berkeley, one of my favorite places to eat. I love looking at this menu, they are now gone because it reminded me of the many times that my father would let me splurge on lobster Newburgh. Uh, that meant that my father had either gambled successfully when he went up to Reno or he did really well at Jim Denio's auction where we were uh, most weekends and he could afford to take us down to the Bay Area and actually eat a, a good meal. I had Lobster Newberg on um, a lot of occasions, but when I see this, I start to cry because one time when I complained because he wanted me to order something less expensive, he physically took me out of the restaurant and wouldn't let me go back in so that my mother and father, or my mother and brothers could eat in peace. Then he just sat outside with me. His disappointment <laughs> in me uh, still upsets me. I have to tell you, I've never acted out in a restaurant again. I was probably around seven. Some of you might recognize this as the Russian tea room. Revisiting the menu from the Russian tea room has always filled me with joy. I was 22 years old um, in New York. I was staffing a life work planning conference with my boss, Richard Nelson Bowles, who wrote the book, What Color Is Your Parachute? And we were eating dinner with N. Richard Nash, who was the author of my favorite play, The Rainmaker. He gave me uh, tickets to be able to see that on Broadway. I was on cloud nine. The meal cost $125 per person in 1974. That was a quarter of my monthly salary. We had caviar with blini, kotelet a la Kiev, babas a rum, and ice cold vodka that they brought out that had been encased in ice with violets. Uh, so for a kid who grew up in the projects of New Helvetia in Sacramento, I just felt like I was wrapped in luxury and I was in listening intently, not only to the brilliant conversation of the people around me, but was really enthralled by the beauty of the room. And this is what the room looked like that first time that I went. This is not my cookbook collection. It's not nearly so orderly right now. Uh, but I thought I would show you. To celebrate our um, first anniversary, the new hubby, uh, Leo, purchased a three-day class for me with Jack Pepin at William Glenn. 
Uh, Jacques provided a paper menu with recipes each day. At the close of the session, he would draw a sketch on mine using ink from the beets or the coffee or uh, the onion skins that he had boiled down. We might have, Dr. Bob might uh, have been in that, well, he was in the same class with me. These are just some of the menus that he decorates. And I love collecting these as well. There is a book of these menus that you might wanna purchase yourself. And that is where my real cookbook and menu collecting a uh, mania began. I soon had over 700 cookbooks, food essays, travel books, memoirs, matchbooks, menus, and napkins. Many were provided by my brother, uh, Keith, who's another avid collector, or his wife, Joan Percal, who is one of the leading purveyors of illustrated books in the country and a folklorist. So she would often tell me the stories of what these cookbooks really meant. I would take the cookbooks every night and I would pour over the recipes Dreaming of the day uh, we could sample culinary delights unavailable here in Sacramento, trips to France, Italy, Spain, China, and unexplored parts of the United States. Uh, I can't be begin to tell you how many paper cuts I got when I would sometimes put them at the end of the bed. Leo ended up feeding my um, mania for it so willingly that when the collection got to the 1000 mark, I wondered if I should consider joining a 12 step program. Some collectors try to limit what they buy. I'm generally a greedy and an eclectic reader. I spend hours with them. I taste the words in my mouth. I love to say words like aioli, soubise, cassoulet. If I'm murdering them, I apologize. There's no rhyme or reason to what I collect. Historic works, regional cookbooks, community cookbooks are just a mirror into the lives of people I've never met. There's also food essays, as I said, memoirs, culinary histories, and odd bits of this and that. This is a picture of MFK Fisher, who is my favorite food writer. Most of the um, recipes I, uh, I find in cookbooks are really useless, whether new or old. I cook by what I have on hand in the fridge, pantry, or garden. I have friends in Renaissance that just bring me things knowing that that's how I cook. But opening an old cookbook, or reading a story by M.F. Fisher, uh, Fisher, I'm transported to some other time and place. I imagine a Provencal village with cobblestone streets and a young woman hurrying home with a loaf of bread. I hear men squabble over who cheated who at cards as they drink Van Ordinaire at the local cafe. I don't wanna uh, delve too long into the history of cookbooks. There are many good sites on the internet, but I will tell you that until the late 1700s, cookbooks in America were published in England or featured English foods. The first all American cookbook was American Cookery 1796 by Amelia Simmons. I will tell you for those that are local, I have 10 facsimiles and will gladly share them among my friends. The Complete Housewife in 1748 is considered to be the first in the 1800s upper class women wrote books for the common woman. They contained information on how to keep house, make soap, set the table, produce home remedies and so on. The cookbook genre as we know it today was developed in the late 19th century by Fanny Farmer. Farmer taught practical cooking to housewives and self-published the Boston Cooking School cookbook in 1896. Recipes used to call for a sprinkle of this and a pinch of that, but she introduced uniform measurements that are still in practice today. She also produced a magazine that I collect on uh, American cookery as well. Community cookbooks began during the uh, Civil War to raise money for wounded or for the widowers, orphans, or um, maimed soldiers. Everyone at least had one of them on their kitchen counter tucked into our drawer or on the bookshelf. A simple spiral bound community cookbook swollen with faded newspaper clippings spattered with pancake batter, dog-eared pages marking favorite recipes, and the occasional handwritten amendment, good or too sweet. These vintage cookbooks rich with community history and lore contain much more than just a catalog of recipes. They tell stories often of conflict and celebration, scarcity and plenty, family and community. They also provide a snapshot of time and place offering really captivating glimpses into the past. 
Fundraising cookbooks in the 19th century were produced by women with no formal training in the kitchen, printed in hardcover in the beginning on steam powered presses to raise money for a church or a women's club or a hospital, school or war relief. Most contained advertising providing a record of local grocers, butchers, bakers and ice cream makers. I have probably 400 regional community cookbooks, the largest in the uh, area, and we'll be donating those eventually to the Sacramento Room and the Sacramento Public Library. Amateur status is really part of the appeal. Most recipes would never be served in today's restaurants. I don't know why we had so many jello salads. That's a question I might ask of all of you. And the thousands of recipes that always have cream of chicken or cream of mushroom soup. But I do miss Harvey Wallbanger cake and the occasional snickerdoodle. Whether or not accompanied by narrative, these cookbooks nevertheless tell stories, part collective autobiography, part fiction. I've always wondered if a Nancy Reagan really made tamale pie while she was in the governor's mansion or if it was her recipe, but all of them provide a taste of the history. As a food historian, we use these books to study why we eat what we eat and what it means, we look at food beyond sustenance, recipes, and taste to explore ways in which food shapes and is shaped by social and cultural forces. Today, I was surprised that there are only 4,000 cookbooks a year um, produced. Uh, more and more recipes are online. There are no records for how many community cookbooks are produced. My assumption is a lot less now than than before. And if anybody's bought any um, modern cookbooks, you know that they're, they change really rapidly. There was a period where it was just two color or one color, then we had to have full color. You have to be a famous uh, chef and um, she's passed away. So I can tell this story now. Biba Cagione, who used to get um, 120,000 for advance for a book, got $1,000 for her last book on spaghetti and she was a, on public uh, television. Menus, restaurant and restaurant menus as we know them today are a relatively new phenomenon. For centuries, when diners walked into an, an eatery, they simply ate whatever the cook was sharing that day. There were menus, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time as early as the second, um, second century BCE in Pompeii, they would uh, find them. There were a lot of writings in which um, they would scold people about not showing up for a reservation for a meal and charge them anyway. I just didn't want to go that far back in uh, history. But one of the things I want to make sure that you know is that menus aren't simply a list of what's to eat. They become barometers of the shifting tides of history. I'm also not going to talk much about the role of the menu in, um, in France in terms of, of the... Um, of course, I'm blank. The revolution. Uh, that I could have done a whole day on. This is the Palmer House uh, in Chicago. Uh, I'll talk about taverns as well. In Europe, prior to the mid 18th century and even in the 19th, dining outside of the home was really regarded as uh, suspicious. The quality of food in these establishments was uh, really horrible. You could not hold it in high regard. Dining outside of the home would typically only occur when a person was traveling and had no access to their own kitchen. The wealthy were more apt to actually bring their um, uh, servants with them who would create food or they would stay in the homes of, of their friends as well. Um, a lot of them had alcohol, but it was not always food, again, of the highest quality. And the patrons of such establishments, many thought to be drunkards and thieves were looked upon with some trepidation as well. The concept of having a number of dishes to choose from uh, with what we're familiar today was not an option at these uh, dining establishments. Uh, and I, I didn't realize I didn't have food in this one. Patrons would sit at a large table at an appointed hour and the eating was family style, would consist of whatever the owner cared to prepare. In many cases, the dishes had the potential to be leftovers or scraps of really the foulest quality imaginable. It was pretty much the same in America. Taverns and boarding houses in the 17th, 18th and up to the mid 19th century would have again served primarily travelers as there was little reason or opportunity 
for most Americans to eat outside of the home. That wouldn't happen really until the Industrial Revolution. And the food in such places um, in Europe especially had little to recommend it. The first restaurants started to emerge in mid 18th century Paris. The word restaurant refers to a restorative meal, meat or broth bouillon offered to people who were too weak to take a full meal. These restaurants were originally served in institutions with the luxurious interiors designed to appeal to the wealthy. They featured individual tables, as I said, dining at unspecified hours and a list of um, dishes that patrons could actually choose from. Even as this type of dining took hold, the idea of a rented or a printed menu still took a while to catch on. Options were often listed on a chalkboard a la carte and recited by the waiter. And here is a typical meal at a boarding house. Uh, this one is from England. For those of you who have heard me do talks on Sacramento, this was as true in the gold rush as almost anything else. I do want to, um, I love this. This is one of the, my favorite menus that I own. You will notice Alice uh, and, and Humpty Dumpty. Uh, Slowly, as restaurants became more uh, formalized, guests were given options. Paper menus started to codify those choices first started appearing in the mid 18th century. This is one I have from um, 1884. It's not the oldest menu I have, but it's one of uh, the ones in the best conditions. They would also be served on chalkboards. Um, dishes and prices were often written on them or recited, I said, by the waiters. It's believed that in 1834, Delmonico's in New York became the first restaurant in the United States to actually have a printed menu. Over the course of the 19th century, restaurants began to add more and more options to their menus, making the old chalkboards really insufficient and the um, offerings too numerous to recite. Those printed menus became more uh, common. What I would love for either Kelsey or Christy to ask me later is if you could talk about the black um, waiter in Chicago who recited 33 items in Yiddish, I'd appreciate that question later. As I said um, before, at the time, dining out was still the domain of the wealthy elite who could afford to eat in a restaurant instead of taking all their meals at home. At around uh, the start of uh, World War I is when Americans began to move away from farms to urban centers for industrial jobs and laborers would eat near their place of work. As more and more Americans purchased automobiles, dining at restaurants became more common. I want you to look closely at this menu because this is menu from the French rotisserie restaurant in old, what's now old Sacramento in 1872. And I was surprised because there's no prices, but it's actually was printed on lined paper and they would write out the menu every day. And this menu included Eastern um, uh, oysters, chicken salad, consomme and cups, chicken fricassee, a cold roast turkey, ham tongue, orange cakes, ice cream and coffee. Menus grew more important, as I said, in the 20s as uh, printing became more technologically advanced and restaurateurs saw the potential of the menu as a marketing tool. That said, menu covers, and I'll show you some in a few, were so low budget that they were um, rarely known would poster artists really design them. There's a few exceptions, which I'll show you, including David Hockney. Um, this is oftentimes all most restaurants would be able to afford. This is one of, again, this is from 1920. You can um, see that the menus are starting to become really cleverly designed. They were selling points and advertisements. Oftentimes they would be given to the customer to, uh, to take home. In the 1930s, and I'll show you the Hockney later, I thought it was here. Um, and this is actually from earlier, the original Poodle Dog. This is also one of my prized possessions that I have. Uh, in the 30s, dining out options kind of exploded. Here's the Hockney. So he illustrated menus. That was the menu cover. I don't remember which this one is uh, from. Um, Dining options started including lunch counters, cafeterias, diners, drive-ins, and supper clubs. They popped up all over the country. The 1933 repeal of Prohibition also brought about uh, really jazzy nightclubs and cocktail 
lounges. This energy incitement around going out combined with advances in commercial art gave birth to the golden era of menu design, which ended in the 60s. Uh, die cuts, these are among my favorite that I like collecting. Die cuts are uh, machine done and they're really clever. Uh, this is the most expensive menu I owned, Cat's Soda luncheon menu. I paid um, at probably at least $60 for one of those. Some of these are quite collectible. This is from Frazzanetti's in Sacramento. It is the was the oldest uh, restaurant in Sacramento. It started in 1897. I do not know if the winery is still operational or not. This is a menu from a Casablanca themed restaurant. So you'll see it actually looks like a fan. One of my favorites, this is from Thailand, the Keynote Club a la carte and wine list. Uh, again, the reason that we started doing matches and business cards was they couldn't afford to give these out. And so they needed to have something that the um, patron could walk away with and something that was also more easily given away. So one of the things about all of these menus is they're really a reflection of pop culture, the eating habits of Americans and a way to follow larger trends. Uh, says uh, Jim Hyman, I am hoping that he's gonna be able to give a talk to us in the fall. He is the editor of Menu Design in America from 1850 to 1895. He just purchased some menus from my brother that I didn't know he had that I wish he hadn't given away, but that's okay. He actually collects more than 6,000 um, menus in his uh, archives. And one of the things that he says is, for example, uh, and I don't have a picture of that, speakeasies in the 1920s had a coded language on their menus. So if it's said that ginger uh, ale is available for your consumption, that meant that there was a mixer for you to bring in and get your alcohol for your booze. During World War II, there was an absence of a lot of these items due to rationing. And in the 1960s, you would start to see artwork reflective of the counterculture. I'll show you uh, some of those later. Of course, as you can tell from this one, we didn't always use uh, menus on paper. Sometimes the menu was just on the side of the cart. This is one for King's Tamales. I don't know if you guys remember, this is the original 15 cent McDonald's burgers and their first menu. And I'll just give you a second to soak that one up. in and out Burgers. These are all chains that started uh, fairly early. You can tell that the price of burgers is starting to go up here. Cheeseburgers were now 40 cents and 35 cents. This was a day when French fries were always hand cut. Uh, this is also for those of you in Sacramento, 1940. That's when Gunther's opened. And when you would go to uh, most soda fountains or whatever, the menu is directly on the wall. The menu to the left where it says dinner steaks and chops, that is a menu that was the original menu for a restaurant called the Rio Vista, or I'm sorry, the uh, Riviera uh, Supper Club, which is in uh, Glenwood Springs, Colorado. I snuck off there, I might say, in October. And this was another place, Brunelleschi's Kids Make Their Own Pizza here. So more and more people are going back to just using those signs. Some menus, however, are what I call about desire. Uh, here's a menu from a meal I've had the good fortune to eat and one I can only dream of one day. This is the French Laundry, but not the French Laundry that most of you have heard about long before it was taken over. Um, um, of course, I'm going to forget his name. Kelsey or uh, Kelsey can uh, go in. Um, Thomas Keller, he purchased it. it. was owned by a woman by the name of Kathy Schmidt. She was actually from Sacramento. Uh, she was giving and providing the fresh vegetables and tiny vegetables for Alice Waters place and decided to go into Yountville and open up her own restaurant. And you can just tell they were handwritten and how little um, the items it was. Eventually she ended up going to the hotel in Boonville and now owns a apple place in Anderson Valley. This is the Fogo Island Inn. 
this is what I am saving my money to do so that I can go to it one uh, day. I'm gonna show you four different menus. The Fogo Island Inn is on an island off the, course of, off the coast of Newfoundland. There's only one way in. This is Fogo Island. This is the menu. You have to stay at the inn and eat the meal. And I'm sure that it approaches close to 650 or a thousand a day. And these are what I call desire menus that eventually someday, maybe if I'm lucky, I'll get to go there. This is what's happening to us today under COVID. You just scan your code with your camera or a QR code reader. Uh, more and more, there are places that are starting to do digital menus. You look for them online. When you get there, you just look at a menu this way. Uh, there, um, so all of these beautiful menus, I think, are eventually going to be given up entirely. Um, what one thing that it does is it really allows the restaurant the ability to broaden and deepen what they do. More and more restaurants are now starting to go seasonable, seasonable because they can either print the menu by day or respond to what uh, the needs are. And uh, how much time am I in? Would you guys like me to take a break and answer some questions and then I'll go on to the other photos? Your option, Christy and Kelsey. We don't have many questions in the chat yet, um, right. but if you wanted to follow up on um, the waiter story from Chicago, the Yiddish speaker, or we oh. can wait till the end to do that. Okay, what I think of that I'll do, it might come up naturally, is, is I'm just gonna keep on going then till we get more. This is, but I will do that story. This is a bill of um, a fair. Uh, you'll notice that these are from chapters. Almost every uh, group, I have a lot of these from Sacramento as well. Mostly men's clubs would get together and they would have, uh, these are commemorative menus that you did go home with. This is again, um, and somebody can remind me, I believe that it is Taft and it is a dinner menu and you can, um, See, I don't know some of these where it says 60. I'm assuming that's 60 cents. Again, for Sacramento people, the Rosemont Grill. The Rosemont Grill, this is a menu that was 40 years after they started. They started in Sacramento actually in 1915. And um, one of the menus that I could not find because the Sacramento room is now closed, they also on their menus would say things like, no yellow hands or black hands touched this food. So a lot of those restaurants tried to destroy those as much as they could later. Uh, there's at least two copies out I hope to get. This is the Saddle Rock restaurant that claims to be from 1849. Each one of you, no matter if you're from here, know of a restaurant like that. Tadich Grill says the same thing. Uh, this restaurant actually didn't start until 1872. Usually when they do provenance from that amount of time, they started some either coffee saloon or a cart uh, and things switched over and they continued to go. But the Saddle Rock was a 24 hour restaurant in Sacramento known, known for their um, oysters and served the Southern Pacific folks. You could go in almost any day or night. Again, pretty famous for Sacramento Capital Tamale Cafe. And this is the interior of that menu. What most people don't know is the owners of that one owned every tamale restaurant in California, including the Tortola. This is actually the Tortola from San Francisco. You'll notice their little tiny cocktail tamales. There is, uh, uh, we've never been able to substantiate it, whether they actually sold that cocktail recipe to, um, the, the main tamale place that we get our little canned tamales for uh, today. They learned how to make tamales from a woman in 1872 in Stockton. And then uh, again, this family, which was mostly Italian, ended up owning all of them. This is Wilson's, which was a confectioner's place that was on J Street. These menus You'll notice the pictures of those. The, when they did those menus, they did not do the artwork. Those were standard and you would have a menu person come to you and you would get to pick the graphics that you wanted. So they were universal. You might find these same menus at, uh, elsewhere. This is Bettles, which was, um, again, this one is 1947. 
you'll see that menus in the old days had lots and lots of food. But if you start comparing these menus, they're almost identical no matter what restaurant was serving it. So in Sacramento, you might find a similar menu at Posey's. And who can forget Blum's? That was the first restaurant that I went to on my own with my own money at 10 with a girlfriend in San Francisco for a hot fudge sundae. It was wonderful. Uh, also in what is uh, Sacramento's Japantown, we had something called the Al Drug Company. They showed up throughout California. They would also uh, have salads and others. This is a die cut from Al Drugs. Again, these are Sacramento, Alan Bud's Platter. Alan Bud's, uh, they were stealing the image from a Dr. Seuss. And I always wondered if they ended up getting sued from him that later became Pancake Parade and then Pancake Circus. And Stan's was um, in Sacramento, it was one of the first drive-ins. They did not pay their women who were the, um, the servers any money. They were on roller skates. They made all their money by tips. He actually owned eight all throughout California. This is the Delta Queen seafood restaurant. Um, there are no menus that exist from 1927, but it's from later. And the hotel senator in Sacramento, I probably have 20 different menus from them. They lasted for so many years. Recently closed, Espanol restaurant. I'm sure that that's true for those of you that are in other cities as they were located in three different places. My father went to all three of them. Uh, they were in what we call Old Sacramento now on 2nd and then on 3rd Street, moved to Folsom. There is a new restaurant. Uh, owners are taking over the space to do an Italian restaurant that came from Bibas. And again, one of my favorite places, Ken's Red Barn, which was on Fulton Avenue, known in Sacramento as Gourmet Gulch. Dick and Eddie's, I wanted to show you this because the press club is a business that um, they decided that they can't continue. They're putting a new business in. When they went to take the signs down, they found the original Dick and Eddie's famous prime rib sign. There is another sign underneath it that I'm not showing a picture of. This are Dick and Eddie's famous prime rib. These are other things that I own from them. So not only do I have matches, but I also collect the table uh, mats. This is a, um, remember when we used to actually smoke and different dinners. Again, for Sacramento, this is what most people remember is the one really fine dining place that you could uh, go out, even though it was a Chinese uh, I could have done a whole show just on Chinese menus, by the way, and tiki menus, but this is the coral reef, and you can just tell from what the prices were, that those prices were considered high. So uh, the one time we went to the coral reef when I was a kid, the lights were low, the waiter came up, and my father started going, why do you have the lights left low? Are you afraid of showing the food? There's no reason. Turn on the lights. Anyway, he embarrassed me, and I never went back. Only time I ever went. One of our favorite places to go, Robert's Fish Grotto and Grill. Uh, there were a lot of menus with nude women and I didn't show very many of them. Um, but again, Robert's Fish Grotto used a menu that was identical to menus elsewhere. You can see how many entrees that they have. Menus used to have a lot more items. Now restaurants really have, um, sometimes only a, a handful of things that they do well. We had a place called Stroh's Neptune Table. Again, Sacramento was really known for its seafood restaurant. They have torn the building down. Elaine Korn, who's uh, worked with me on Capital Public Radio and her husband, David Suhu, who owned about eight different restaurants owned um, Stroh's for a little while as well. And from New York, I have a lot of menus from New York. This is from the Cotton Club. And uh, I could have one of you do it, but this is what surprised me that black, uh, now, first of all, the Cotton Club was black musicians couldn't, uh, but you could not go there. It was a whites only club, but they had a Chinese menu and an American menu. And that was true for a lot of the restaurants um, menus that were uh, open for, uh, for people in general, it was good food. This is from the 60s. High Society, a restaurant coffee house, fresh fruits, vegetables, marketplace every day morning till late night. This is from San Francisco. 
so there was a time when menus could be really clever. Pancake Parade, which turned into Pancake Circus. Some people might remember the Hotel El Rancho, which is in West Sacramento. By the time um, I was here, it had become really run down. But there was a time when people would fly up from Hollywood to eat at the restaurant and enjoy their jazz music, including um, Humphrey Bogart and um, Bing Crosby. The Fish Emporium, paper menu. They realized that they didn't have to spend a lot of room on menus and one of the reasons they did the paper one is they did a lot of specialty meals and so they would also do an attachment every day that would tell you what the special was that day souvenirs really bring memories i don't know if every anybody's gone down highway 99 uh, but the blueberry hill cafe was the one place that when you were going from sacramento to los angeles we stopped off each way going down and coming back. So for a kid, this was a delight. I will um, tell you the story. Well, the truth is I stole most of those menus. I, I didn't purchase a lot of these. So almost all of these menus were ones that I stole at different times. Um, Biba, this is just a specialty menu. We used to have Dine Downtown in 2017. One of my favorite places to eat was Antonina's. This is a luncheon menu. It was the kind of place that my mother took me to. Uh, she would save her money up for months at a time. You can see from the meals that they aren't all that expensive, but you wore white gloves to be able to uh, go there. And a lot of people from the legislature came. This is also one of my fantasy menus. My favorite restaurant in New York closed now is called Florent. It was opened 24 hours. You could go in at two o'clock in the morning, you would see celebrities, regular people, you can see it's open 24 uh, hours and get French bistro type of meals. Uh, and this one is one, uh, and I love the extra stuff that they have here. So from one of them in November, a soup was boudin, warm tarts, gusty winds, watch for heavy wearings, wear your galoshes and no business like show business. Again, they would give you the price to go to uh, Leningrad, Dar es Salaam, or Toledo. And I was really sad when they closed. I've included Omar Khayyam's because of course everything is a story. I talked a little bit about husband number one. He did not plan a, a honeymoon even though he had promised me. We had not eaten probably for two days. It's 10 o'clock at night. I insisted on going to San Francisco to the St. Francis Hotel. The only restaurant that was open was Omar Khayyam's at 10 walked in the door, asked them for a menu, and they said, we're sorry, but we stopped serving. Um, and I just started crying. And he said, the only thing that I have uh, is I have some pheasant that I can bring you. And he brought these little tiny pheasant, um, little tiny, it was a little Tweety bird, and it was dry and it was, kind, it was horrible. Um, and I knew at that point, I should have realized it would take five and a half years that marriage was not going to work. And I'll show you one of my, uh, this is one of my favorites, and then I'll stop sharing. This is Bibenden. And um, I was deeply in love with my uh, late husband who passed away five uh, years ago. This was, uh, his alter ego was Bibenden. Uh, and that is the tire guy from the Michelin. This is the restaurant that we were able to eat and they had an oyster bar. And you can again see how opulent it is and was. And uh, my good friends are probably here tonight, Rick Castro and Lawrence Fox. They stole this menu for me as well. I want to thank uh, the writers and researchers before me, uh, Jim Hyman especially, and Stephen Hepler. He's written like 180 different books on design and graphics and John Mariani. John Mariani is somebody that I read religiously. If you're a food historian, he's written books on diners and restaurants. He's got a, a weekly, um, a newsletter that comes to me and he's very generous in letting me quote from him. Henry Vaught is the largest collector of menus. Currently, he's got a blog that I'll give people um, later. He's donated a lot to the New York Public Library. The New York Public Library has a menu program. They have over 50,000 menus. Again, Rick and Larry and I flew up to New York and I learned how to do crowdsourcing so that we could actually take the menus and then write down the recipes for other people to use. Jim also wrote a book called May I Take Your Order? 
that I used my apologies to Alison Perlman, who uh, wrote May We Suggest, which is about restaurant menus and the art of persuasion. And my absolutely favorite blogger, Jan Whitaker, who has a blog called Waitress, uh, Restauranting Through History that I'm really upset about because if she hadn't thought of that blog, then I would have. And that is it. I'm gonna open for questions or conversations. So again, uh, Christy and Kelsey are going to moderate, but if anybody wants to ask questions or share. You need to tell that story, Mary Ellen. Oh, okay. Thank you. So um, I only went to Chicago to visit my uh, relatives once when I was about 14 and a half. And my father took us to the old neighborhood that he had grown up in which, um, and there was one Jewish deli that was left. And what shocked me is when we went in, there was a black waiter who looked like Robert Mitchum, except he was black. And he had a Yiddish accent. So he would do all of the recitations using this Yiddish accent that came time for desserts. And this was previous to me to, um, uh, what's the 33 flavors of ice cream, Baskin Robbins. He recited all 33 desserts to me, first in English, and then he recited them in Yiddish. And so I asked him, how did you do that? And he said, kidneys, ma'am, kidneys. And I don't know why, but that struck me as incredibly funny, and I used that later. And then I'm going to share the uh, other story is about why you should not go to a restaurant that doesn't have a menu. So my husband, uh, Leo and I are in Rome and we go to the Trest, uh, Trastevere, which is the Jewish quarter of, of Rome. It is fairly early. We are just looking for menus on the outside of restaurants where we know we're not gonna go eat till like eight or nine o'clock. It's probably six o'clock at night. We go in and there's a place that has no menu outside. All the other places do. And this little woman comes out and she's literally, you know, her back is, is uh, decrepit. And she comes and she goes, it was the Gaeta guest house. She goes, you have to come in. This is the favorite restaurant of Sophia Loren. Fellini eats her almost every night. Marcello Mastriani, uh, he's naming all of this. You've got to eat. And we said, no, 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 we'll come back because we have no idea what the prices are. That's the other reason for always looking at a menu. But we felt so bad because there was nobody else in that we went in. And it was from the 17th century, it was ice cold, we were freezing. When it came to a menu, we asked for the menu and she just kind of faltered and her English wasn't very uh, uh, good. So she brings her husband out, he's the, he's the chef. So I would say at the time she was 80, he was probably 96, he comes out. And, and he explains to us that there is no menu, but he recites what he thinks that we're going to really enjoy. So the first thing is a carpaccio, which I knew what it was, which is uh, you know uh, meat that is kind of raw. The second dish was chicken diavolo. And the third dish was tiramisu. So first comes the first dish, the carpaccio, and he's obviously put it in the freezer and then shaved it really fine so that it is literally frozen and ice cold when we go to eat it. He then brings us the chicken diavolo. The chicken diavolo we called roadkill chicken. It literally still had the tracks on the chicken, the, the tire tracks from the car. It was greasy. I mean, when I mean grease, I'm talking axle grease, grease. It was horrible. The tiramisu was lady fingers like you get in a package. You know, the, the, not the, the type that are handmade, but literally that you would get in an American store with a uh, Cool Whip and something else. It was horrible. We had a, a bottle of their Van Ordinaire, and now we wait for the bill to come. It ended up being 107 before the tip. It was the most expensive meal that we had in Italy. Oh and the God. only time we've ever had a meal that uh, was horrible. It was really... Uh, Horrible. So that's why you never ever go to a restaurant that doesn't have a menu. Wow. Good. So more questions or Ma share. Mary Ellen, we have uh, Ann Burroughs who says she has a story about Jello recipes. Thank you, Ann. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Ann, and share that story with us. In fact, 
I'd like to invite everyone, if you're willing, to go ahead and turn on your video so we have a better sense of a, a community here. But if not, uh, stay with well, us. My, my, <laughs> my story is I was raised in a little town about 70 miles north of here. And uh, it was a farming community. My dad grew walnuts. And um, uh, it seemed like everybody in town belonged to the same social clubs. The Lions Club, the, the um, uh, uh, oh gosh, the, w several church groups. You know, the ladies were all kind of uh, divided by age in the, in the uh, church groups. And... Um, but there, there got to be a competition between all the ladies for who could bring the newest Jello salad recipe, <laughs> and it got it got kind of hilarious actually. And um, I luckily have saved all those recipes. Some of them are god awful, but <laughs> others are really good. So I <laughs> that that's my Jello salad story. <laughs> Thank you. So anyone else I'm going to, sh I'll, I'll share while we're waiting. We do want you to share and uh, cookbook stories, collecting recipes, your mother's favorite thing. Um, my mother was a, a, I thought a horrible cook. Now I miss her cooking. Uh, this is the, uh, not the oldest cookbook I have, but the most valuable cookbook. And you can tell that it is literally falling apart. It is from 1872. And you're not going to be able to see much of it. What is significant about this is this is a manuscript cookbook. And I really like collecting manuscript cookbooks, which are the handwritten cookbooks that people uh, collect. I have over 10,000 recipe cards. Remember that first one that I showed you as well? This one, however, was a real find. I was at a rare book uh, fair and a book dealer whom I normally can't afford just came up and said, you know, I just got these manuscript cookbooks and I, I don't want to mess with them. I'm just trying to sell it. Um, and I looked inside and it was, the handwriting said, started when she was 15, 1872, Abigail Adams Johnson. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> so yeah, there's gas, right? Didn't take me long to go. Abigail Adams, I mean, it had to be related in some way to the family. I just really quickly, you know, you have to be surreptitious. I don't know if anybody goes to rare book things, but you have to be surreptitious. They don't like you going onto the internet <laughs> to search these things out. And I find that she was married to Rensselaer of Rensselaer University and that she was indeed the granddaughter of Abigail Adams and John Adams. And some of these recipes come from her grandparents. Oh my God. I have uh, taken a class called um, Reading Historic Cookbooks from Barbara Wheaton, who's one of the most incredible food historians in the country at Radcliffe. I had gone there for a week to take a look at historic cookbooks with um, a couple of other members that might be here uh, tonight. And um, I just called them up because I thought, you know what, this is something that I really should donate to them. But I did, and I was having trouble reading it. I was hoping that somebody could help me read it, that I could get a cookbook out of it and donate the book. And so when I called, they, they said, um, how much? And I thought they wanted to know how much I had paid for the book, which I'll be honest was $200, which is the most I had ever spent for one up, up to that point. I've, I've since spent more. And they said, um, no, how much for us to uh, have it? I said, no, I intend on donating it. And basically what it came um, down to <laughs> is that they would eventually, you know, give me, there's, they have fellowships. I'll eventually get a fellowship there to actually do the work on this book. They will have it and it'll be turned into a cookbook with the history of, the, of, of Adam's family eventually. Uh, the reason for sharing it is you never know. It's the kind of book that uh, every other dealer passed by because it wasn't in good condition. So when you're looking at cookbooks, some of the worst ones, um, are, are the ones that are crumbling. And, and I'm not gonna reach for it now. I also have original letters from Julia Child. I have coffee napkins where she had coffee with people and she signed them. And oftentimes I have found, um, I found one of those in a cookbook that was a signed Julia Child cookbook that I paid $5 for at the Friends of the Sacramento Public Library. And then it had the uh, autograph as well, so. 
All right, Ellen, I have, a, I have a quick story if you want a story. Yes. Okay. Um, I was visiting, this was quite a few years ago. My husband and I were visiting, uh, having Thanksgiving dinner with my uh, sister-in-law and her husband. And she fixed this wonderful ham sauce with the ham. I just loved it. So I asked if I could have a copy of the recipe. Oh, oh no, this is my husband's family recipe. We cannot share this recipe. So I said, okay. And so the next year she fixed the same thing. And I said, I just love that ham sauce recipe. Same thing, oh no. So one day she gives me a call and she says, I'll let you have the recipe, but just don't tell anybody I gave it to you. So I said, okay. So I kind of let forgot about it. And that kind of went by. And, and then about a couple of years later, I'm sitting, I'm going through an old Watkins cookbook. Okay, 1927. And Watkins was the people who went door to door that sold spices. Oh my gosh. Oh, that was just a door to door. And what do I find? I find the identical <laughs> family recipe in a 1927's Watkins cookbook. <laughs> that, that's a wonderful story. I might uh, mention we have some other people that wanted to share stories. I watched a fantastic presentation yesterday about James Beard, not realizing what a plagiarist he was, that he would oftentimes steal recipes from other cookbooks. He would plagiarize from himself and he would not uh, attribute anything um, to anyone. And you'd be surprised how often I will look at a cookbook and I will just sit there and I'll do the same thing going, come on, that just came off the Philadelphia cream cheese you know, <laughs> package. And how many times can you do a Toll House cookie? So Cindy had a Jell-O salad story. I do have a Jell-O sa salad story. It's a, a quick story. My mother worked full time my whole childhood through the 50s and 60s and yet was always responsible for the holiday dinners and my stepfather's kids and grandkids would all come down and you know I don't know how she did it without microwave ovens and all the things we have now so she always was making things ahead and Mary Ellen maybe you can tell me when did the Waldorf salad become popular was that the 50s or 60s uh, I think actually earlier than that so that came from the Waldorf Astoria yeah so um, earlier, like the 40s? Yeah, I think that that was much earlier from the Waldorf Astoria. Okay. So, uh, and I, I, I will check it while somebody else is doing it. But that is one of my favorite uh, salads. And also, you will notice that a lot of recipes, what the original Waldorf salad was versus the version that a lot of people end up using, because some people add grapes. Uh, and they do a composed salad. It was very different than the mayonnaise cloth. I don't mean to be negative, but the mayonnaise cloth that we have. The actual Waldorf salad was a very clean salad that was a composed salad and layered, and it's beautiful. Well, my mother's was not the original Waldorf salad, but she wanted to be rather fancy for the holiday dinners. And so she found a recipe for a make-ahead Waldorf salad. And that consisted of red jello, chopped walnuts, chopped celery, and chopped apples. And then it was topped with a combination of mayonnaise and sour cream. And um, I have made it on occasion and it doesn't matter who is at the table. Everybody takes seconds, they all love it. I, I say I'm embarrassed to make it, but this is my heritage. It's gone, <laughs> it's one of the first things gone. So jello salad, Waldorf salad. I love it. So I just checked really quickly. A Waldorf salad was uh, started in, uh, that's what I thought, 1896. Oh my. So, uh, and uh, I have finally, it took me a long time. We have a cheesecake story from Sharon. I finally found out the origin of the Watergate salad. So the Watergate salad was a salad that had been around for forever and ever. But whenever there's a big event, like something like that, people, one person just, you know, uh, it wasn't ever served there. It's just the, that, that the Watergate became such an important icon that it adapted literally that name. And some things are different names depending on what region you know, obviously they uh, come from. I might say one thing about uh, hotel menus 
San Francisco has so many original things that were created out of San Francisco, including Salary Victor from the St. Francis, Green Goddess dressing, um, uh, sourdough bread. I mean, you can go on and on and on. Sacramento has never had anything original to us, which I think is interesting. And we have a cheesecake story from Sharon. Sorry, trying to unmute myself. So my mother had this wonderful cheesecake that she always made and she, she loved to tell us the story that this friend of hers had made this wonderful cheesecake and my mother wanted the recipe and the woman was like, oh, no, 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 I don't give my recipes out. No, you can't have it. Well, one night my mother and the, and the woman were out with their husbands um, dancing and drinking cocktails and my mother got the woman to write the recipe on the cocktail napkin and she always said she doesn't know to this day that I have her cheesecake recipe. <laughs> oh, that's a great story. Ter Terry has a thing about Carrie Bible. Terry, did you want to say that yourself or have uh, Christy read it? Um, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, Carrie um, collects cookbooks of the stars. So they come out of the 30s and 40s, whatever. And then she does this program. I don't think she does it every Sunday, but um, it's called Hollywood Kitchen. And she tapes them and puts them on her YouTube channel. So you can go back, you know, if you're not, if you miss it. And, um, but she's gotten to where um, she brings on guests. Oh, and wow. yeah, yeah, so um, as I wrote, um, last week was really good. She had um, Joan Crawford's meatloaf, and she had a man who's a Joan Crawford expert, and um, but also her grandson, and so that was really fascinating. So she she does the really the really fun programs. Oh, that would be wonderful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. one of the other. One of the things that got me interested in uh, collecting was actually Dinah Shore. Okay. For some reason, we're getting some uh, feedback. Can either Christy or anyone tell me why? I'm not sure. And it sounds like I'm getting feedback too. That's, that's not well, easy. I can mute myself. Yeah, maybe if we mute Terry, let's see what happens. So one of the next, oh, my apologies, I forgot to turn off my phone, sorry. Uh, someone asked me before we go to the next questions, how, you, how I store my menus. And I don't know if you can see this, but um, I get archival backboard, which uh, I order, I get mine from a comic book store, believe it or not. And then uh, a special paper so that I can store it in archival uh, paper so that it doesn't yellow. And what I like is that way, instead of storing flat, I can actually store mine. I can put them in alpha order in any other way that um, I want to. And I have large, uh, fairly large sheets of, of paper to be able to do that. And it just makes it easy because what I found is by storing flat, I can never find anything that I you know, want. So um, it's an easy way to find it. And then someone, Terry also, did anyone else drink the dark flavored Jello as a remedy for a cold? I've never heard that, Terry. Oh yes, Jello water. Yes, that was good for you when you had a cold because it had protein. <laughs> I'm sorry. And <laughs> and Alona, did you ever go to Mama Leone's in New York on 44th Street? Yes, and I have recipes. Um, uh, I have both recipes and menus. Um, my favorite is I've just collected, I have a signed by, oh, you guys can't tell him <laughs> because it might go to Mike Agron. So I'm going to be veiled here. Patsy's was a famous singer's favorite place to eat. Mike Agron does programs about him. You Sacramento people might know who I meant and it's got his signature. So I'm going to give that one as well. Well, I went to uh, Mama Leone's and uh, it's the only menu I've ever stolen. 
and I have it mounted on my wall. Um, it's poster size because it came all folded. Oh, right. And it was in 1988, uh, April of 1988 when I was there. And um, a pasta dinner in 1988 cost, just a regular pasta dinner was twenty ninety five. Um, oh my God. Yeah. And, and, uh, it was, uh, you know, it was kind of the upstairs and that's where it was just off of Broadway there where, um, uh, and you'd see the movie stars, but I only was there one time, but the post, that was the only menu that I ever stole and, uh, it's mounted on my wall. It's beautiful. Mary Ellen, it's Marsha. I haven't heard that name in years. I grew up in that restaurant in the fifties and the sixties. I lived on the <laughs> island, but we used to go into the city all the time. And oh my God, such memories when you just said that name, Mama Leone's, amazing. Yeah, I've got over in the box over here, uh, I've got uh, the stage deli, I collect all the, the deli ones as well. This is great. I have, um, somebody has, uh, Susan has a story about her dad and microwave fudge. Yes, this is along the lines of I don't give my recipes out. <laughs> um, I was born in Alabama. I've lived here all my life. My dad lived in Chicago, Illinois at, with my stepmom and he loved to bake and he would bake for everybody in his apartment building, everybody that worked, you know, he would just give away and he, that's what he loved to do. Well, when I was in high school, which has been some years ago, Indicator Daily, which is our newspaper here, they printed a bunch of microwave recipes. And so I just sent them up there to him because the microwave fudge was simple, easy. It was really good. And so he started making it for everybody. Well, they, everybody wanted the recipe. And he'd say, no, it is an old family recipe. I can't give it to you. <gasps> this went on for a couple of years. So somebody finally looked at him and said, now, David, how old can this old family recipe be? It's using the microwave. <laughs> and he said, well, I wondered how long it would take y'all to, to say something to me about it. Of course, then he would give out the recipe. But they, they went along with him for a couple of years before they told him, you know, it, it can't be. So he, he got a great kick out of that one. That is wonderful. So uh, I'm gonna share one more uh, story. We didn't talk about tasting menus. Uh, tasting menus is now, you know, what you do where you get eight courses, 10 courses, you don't know what the chef is going to be serving. Um, the French Laundry certainly does that. I've never been able to, um, to uh, afford it. Uh, and I, I won't share that story, but I did have the good fortune of going to the restaurant Single Thread Farm, which is, and Kelsey can correct me, I believe it's in Hillsburg. And I was invited to a tasting menu along with the La Dame de Scoffier group, including a Margot True and Jerry Vecchio, who had been editors of Sunset Magazine, um, Dolores, uh, or, uh, Doris, uh, Cake Bread. Uh, again, Kelsey, I'm trusting you to, uh, to do this. It was uh, um, Janet Fletcher, who's written many books on, on cheese. It was really an illustrious group. And the first thing that we did was to go to their farm and at the farm, you actually, the, all the chefs have to work it. We could pick our own food for dinner if we wanted to. We then went back to the uh, place. It was uh, based on a Japanese uh, ryokan. You were expected to stay there. The meal normally was $6.75. The lunch would have been $375, 17 courses. We paid 65 as a donation to something. Um, they had champagne up on the roof. They showed us the rooms, which are 1500 uh, a night. You're expected to stay at least three nights. You could not do a meal there for less than $5,000. Go in for the tasting menu. They would not um, allow us to take photos, which surprised me because they just wouldn't allow it. <laughs> I think it's because we were doing it at a time when we were barely uh, paying for it. Uh, and they gave us the 17 courses. And I remember there were two items that reminded me of Anthony Bourdain, where he just said, you just had something that's so sublime, you know, it blows your head off. There were two like that. But I remember the other 15 going, mm, you know, that was nice. Three Michelin star, didn't impress me much. Um, I mean, I love the company, the ambience, the everything about the decor, the bowls that they used, everything was just top notch. 
Uh, but I remember thinking that I didn't know that I would recreate that experience. I went out and again, I don't know if Rick and Larry are online. They had driven me down there and um, they said, how was it? And I said, I'm hungry. So they took me to Hogs Island at, um, uh, in uh, Napa where we proceeded to have oysters that were $1.50 each that were the most wonderful oysters I think I've eaten, a green bean salad and two bottles of wine for $87.50. So that was my experience with the tasting menu. Anyone else would like to share a story? I have a, a story, uh, Mary Ellen, this is Christy. Um, this is uh, on my mother who, who was not, really fond of cooking, but the one technique she gave me is, was to be willing to experiment with cooking, which you can do, but she was adamant, don't experiment with baking because that's chemistry. And uh, so those were probably the two of the best lessons she ever gave me. But I remember as a child of her being enamored with Julia Child when Julia was on television at the very beginning. And she spent an, a whole afternoon, many afternoons watching her, but this one afternoon in particular, she was doing some kind of French um, meal. I don't think it was beef bourguignon, it, but something similar, highly labor intensive, required all kinds of cheesecloth and boiling things and different packets. And she went out and bought all the ingredients and spe spent all afternoon cooking the dinner. And when it got all finished, she was so exhausted she could barely taste it. And the rest of us as a family went, eh, you know, it's nice, mom. It just tastes like stew or something. And she never fixed a Julia Child meal again. <laughs> it was so much work, she couldn't stand it. <laughs> oh, that, that again, a great story. You'll notice that I glossed over the cookbooks because you couldn't do the cookbooks and the uh, menus. I cannot uh, tell you enough that... Um, a, a few people really changed how we eat in America. Uh, one is James Beard that I alluded to, but really it was Julia Child. Because up to that point, when uh, you'll read all these old cookbooks, you were expected to know how to do something. If they say braise or do this, you know, all those recipe cards, I have 10,000 of them. What are they? They're that big, three by five cards has everything you need to know to get that recipe done. What she did was to give us the step-by-step -step exactly what size pan, music quarter, pound this. Sometimes if you look at her recipes, they're four or five or six or seven pages long. But by going through that and, um, uh, and also gourmet, I don't know how many people looked at gourmet magazine, you know, the reader's recipes that they used to send in. You know, that's for a lot of us really learned how to uh, cook in a way that our, our parents never uh, could have. So I, I think we really need to credit Julia Child with a lot. And then you take her cooking class, you know, what she did in terms of cooking. Um, pretty, pretty amazing. And uh, Karen says, I remember enjoyed watching the Galloping Gourmet on TV when I was young. I remember that too. So uh, Karen, this is funny. The last three cookbooks that uh, I uh, uh, just got in the last week were first editions of the Galloping Gourmet. First, second, and third book. <clears throat> there are some books that you can't give away now. And one was Jeff Smith. I don't know if anybody remembers him. He used to have a television program. Then you found out he was a pedophile. And now you literally can't give his cookbooks away. And so uh, again, anybody else before we stop recording, I like to do a green room where we stop recording, uh, but then people who are too shy can continue a conversation in the green room for a few minutes. Marianne? Yes. I, I have another story, a family story that is kind of related, related to Christie's story in a way. Um, <laughs> my sister-in-law and I got on a, a kick of learning how to make Chinese food. And so she took a class and uh, shared the recipes, all the recipes with me. Well, I was always, as a kid, trying to impress my father, which, you know, was kind of a thankless task in a way. But anyway, I took all this food up to their house and I, I just, you know, messed up the kitchen and I, <laughs> I really, you know, went all out and we sat down to eat. And then, you know, he, he was eating because we all love Chinese food. I, I have to put that in. 
Um, and I, I, I said, hey, Dad, you know, how, how is it? And he said, well, he said, that was a lot of chopping. Not that it tasted good or, oh gosh, it was wonderful or whatever. That's a lot of chopping. Oh, I love it. So uh, everything leads me to another story. I'm so sorry. One more story and then we'll stop and, and go on to the, the green room. Um, my, um, my mother, to the best of my knowledge, I, she never wrote down anything. You know, she didn't actually have recipes on all, all those cards. But um, after she died, my brother gave me a cookbook that, um, and I, I'm sorry, I don't have it, that she had written out by hand when he was uh, on his way to Los Angeles. And it has about 12 recipes in it. What was amazing about the recipes is that not one of them was how I remember her cooking. And I did watch her, um, you know, cook. And so I realized that for some reason she gave him recipes that she thought that a man would cook and, and not the real recipes. Um, and it's really amazing. I am including that story along with a story about my, in my father's kitchen. My father also didn't use recipes, uh, but what he used was whatever he could buy at the market. So when he died, my one brother was left, I think, with 180 uh, Chun King chow mein noodles in the can. I was left with at least 48 um, chicken broth cans from Campbell's Soup. And the little, it's, remember the, marsh, the, the, the uh, mushrooms in the little can? That was my legacy from my um, from my father. I, I, I have to tell you. So, recipes. I'm going to suggest that um, Christy, you can do closing remarks here, and then I'll stop the recording, and then we'll stay for a few more minutes. Well, thank you, Mary Ellen. What a great trip down memory lane, as well as uh, all the other information that you've gathered and gleaned, and showing us your archives, cookbooks and recipes and, and matchbook covers. Thank you everyone for joining us. Hope you'll come back and uh, join us again because there's always something good going on at the Renaissance Society.